quite excited that tonight we have Nancy Glazier, a colleague of mine from Western New York, that's going to be talking about uh, outdoor management of uh, livestock. So Nancy, you can go ahead and uh, start sharing. And if you want to self-introduce a little bit more, that'd be great. Thanks, Rich. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Right. Well, welcome. Uh, I'm glad everybody could join you tonight or join me tonight. I got to get situated here. All I see are pictures across my screen of everyone. Um, just a little bit about myself. I work for the Northwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team uh, along the Lake Ontario Finger Lakes region. I've been with the team for about 25 years, um, kind of in split service. I started as a, in field crops as a pest management technician and then trans transitioned over to livestock and I do a little bit of dairy. Um, I, you know, focus in dairy or excuse me, livestock and do a lot with management or marketing, um, some beginning farmer education. I'm also the co-coordinator. Yes. I'd like to interrupt. You're, you're being very choppy. So maybe you want to turn off your video feed. Okay. And that might help. Uh, so sorry about that. Well, I live in rural uh, Western New York. So that could be part of the reason. Okay. So let's get start, get back here. Um, I am the co-coordinator for New York Beef Quality Assurance which I think highlights some of my commitment to animal care and well-being. I also am the advisor for the New York Pork Producers, and we've just been doing uh, quite a bit of education on the topic of African swine fever. And as I got ready for tonight, I thought about this. It was several years ago I presented on some of the work I was doing with the Cornell All Forge Fed Test. Um, many years, well, a few years ago at your conference. Let's get this thing presenting here. My slides aren't advancing real great. So kind of a, just a rough idea where we're headed for the evening. You know, why are we talking about some winter, outwintering animals? Just a little bit in nutrition, because that's an important piece with outwintering in cold weather. What kind of sites, windbreaks, um, feeding pad options, other feeder options, and water. I like to focus on that a little bit just and say, um, you know, there's requirements for animal food, water, and shelter. That water component is really what drives the intake. But I'd like to have some discussion at the, at the conclusion. I guess if you have any questions as I go along. You can enter those in the chat and, and Ben will stop me and we can kind of get things clarified. But I am sorry that we're not in person tonight because that's when some of our best discussion occurs when we're all together and that farmer to farmer sharing is really, really important. Um, I've learned a lot over the years from farmers. You know, I learned a little bit from my education, but the real education comes with working with farmers. My focus is mostly on beef cattle, but there's a little bit in there that pertains to sheep. So if we have some sheep experts, please uh, clarify things at the end. So this was taken from a farm that was just burning some brush and limbs. And I thought, well, isn't this would be great to keep Animals warm all winter if you keep that fire burning, but it's not very practical. Just kind of a interesting photo. So this shot was taken from an early spring site on a farm in Monroe County. So if you're familiar with that neck of the woods, it's rather suburban. Sprawl is moving in on some farms. This this farmer had been on this operation for many years and he was always continuously working to improve his pastures, his water, his fencing. You can see in the distant background there where suburbia is really encroaching on his operation. Only open owned by people that really have no idea about agriculture. 
let alone that it's okay to have livestock outdoors during the winter. So keep that in mind that your neighbors and your not so close neighbors are watching. Um, I don't wanna offend anybody, but that's just kind of the way things have moved. Um, this guy had done a great job with his neighbors and that neighbor relation, the education piece, you know, anything, you know, this was, um, any spilled feed and excess manure was cleaned up in the spring to, to get it ready for some um, little bit of renovation and some grazing. And I don't know how the Delaware County area was, but in the past couple of years, I had gotten a lot more calls related to animal welfare. And I think some people were out during lockdown walking and they were just taking a closer look. So one farmer had told me, just keep in mind that somebody might be watching and whatever she does on her operation, she feels that somebody could be watching. So she's always trying to do a good job. It's also important to keep in mind that environmental aspect, you know, keep those practices um, environmentally friendly to maintain that water quality. So I think you've all seen some of these challenges. It seems like mud season lasts longer and longer. You know, where do you put your animals? Do you have the space? How do you feed? And I know Rich set up the polls and I know we have quite a range of herds or flocks in the meeting tonight. You know, the state average is roughly 15 cows in the herd. So, you know, they're pretty some of this stuff can be geared, there's geared towards our operations, but it can be scaled back or vice versa. So it just takes a little bit of planning. Just a little bit of nutrition. You know, I think we, sh we all know that livestock can handle the cold if they're acclimated. They've had the fall, early winter to get acclimated. They've gotten used to those cooler temperatures and you've had a chance, <clears throat> excuse me, to test your forages, your hay, to make sure you have a high enough quality hay for the animals that you're feeding. And if you don't have that quality in the supply, you can always supplement somewhat. And keep in mind uh, that you, you need to maintain the adequate birth weight, or excuse me, body condition score at birthing, whether they're cows, heifers, or ewes. This is just a, a slide showing you how temperatures and intake are impacted. Um, livestock have that thermal, thermal neutral zone and you know, intake and maintenance requirements stay fairly steady. Tonight, since we're focusing on winter, you know, we're gonna look at the cold side here. You know, an intake really doesn't change a whole lot. Uh, but the maintenance require goes up, maintenance requirements. So animals need more of that energy from their intake just to maintain their bodily functions. And there may be less uh, energy available for any kind of production, whether it's uh, lactation, gain, or gestation. So it's not really shown on this graph, but if the weather gets too cold, intake may drop if your animals kind of bunch up or huddle up, they stay together and they don't want to go, they don't want to leave that group to go feed. So animals can withstand cold temperatures when that wind is calm and they're dry, but the impact from the wind can really make things a lot more challenging, makes it challenging for you and your animals. In that green zone, you stay fairly comfortable and you can see, you know, on this side, as it wind speed picks up, uh, the wind chill drops. And I think this weekend, at least in my neck of the woods, it's forecast to be some pretty cold temperatures. I haven't really heard what the wind is, but kind of a rule of thumb to think about when you're out doing chores. You know, if, you're, if you get really uncomfortable from the cold and the wind, I bet your animals are a little bit uncomfortable as well. Some other stressors can impact intake. 
rain can just temporarily depress intake. Um, seems like we've had that as well early winter. Mud can have a huge impact. You know, it can reduce, even four to eight inches can reduce uh, intake five to 15%. And severe mud, that can really cause issues. It'll, uh, it'll make it tougher for your livestock just to get around and they really need some suitable bedding in that situation. I've actually visited a dairy, or excuse me, a beef farm that had lost a cow from being stuck in the mud. So it happens. Um, it's just a, it's a huge stressor, stressor and it takes a lot more energy for animals to deal with that constant mud. I'll let you all discouraged. Those, some of the challenges can be overcome with some planning. Um, you know, selecting that site ahead of time, whether it's for a long or short-term stay, maybe you can stage your bales of hay so you can access those a little bit more easily through the winter. You know, and, and what's your water source? You know, that can always be a challenge on its own, own when it gets cold with freezing temperatures, water lines freezing, tanks freezing, you know, what can you do to help work through some of those issues? Do you have any bedding material or spilled hay that the animals can lay on just to get up off the ground a little bit? And if you feed a little bit remote, you may need some equipment to move that hay, whether it's a tractor or some kind of a loader. And what about winter access? You know, if you need to bring more hay to the area, will you be able to do that? Fill the feeders. Um, and also, will you have to move any sick animals out of, the, out of the area back to the home farm or the barn just to check on them or do any sort of processing? So those are some things just to plan ahead with. So what about site selection? You want something kind of high and dry. You don't want big puddles to form. Um, they can get icy and cause other issues. Which direction is your prevailing winds? You know, if there's some kind of a uh, windbreak or something there to slow down the wind, maybe along the edge of woods. Do you have any paddocks that need any renovation or rejuvenation? You know, the, those could be some spots. Again, that water supply. And also, you know, think about, um, are they environmentally sound locations? And some of these ideas that I'm gonna talk about can be scaled up or down depending on your operation. I thought this was a pretty picture you know, the cattle are up there on the hill. It'd be kind of a nice spot for them to spend where the water source was down by the, the road where I am. So that has to be kept in mind to get water to them. Um, there's a laneway there too to, to bring in bales of hay is needed. So I don't know if anybody does any out wintering out on crop fields or pastures that are kind of run out and need to be uh, like a complete renovation or something. If it's a cornfield, the uh, grain then leaves and stalks will be eaten, but it's kind of a short-term fix depending on how, or a uh, spot depending on how many animals you have. Um, the manure and any, if any uh, hay is fed out there, any waste hay that's already out there on the field for fertilization. You want to make sure you stay away from any sensitive areas. You don't want any runoff con uh, concerns as the weather gets warmer or any snow melt. I took this in December so that you can kind of see a little bit of snow on the cow's back. So they're fairly comfortable that snow is kind of on their backs. Um, disadvantage would be if you had crop fields and you didn't have fence around it. But just depending on what class of animals and how um, docile they are, they are, you might be able to get by with a strand of fence on the perimeter. But you do need to have other feed available if uh, there's limited amounts of crops out there. 
And another option, uh, you know, maybe you could graze some cover crops. If it's not too deep of snow, you might be able, the cattle might be able to dig down or even sheep dig down a little bit to find something to eat. Compaction can be a concern too, depending on the conditions and how long any animals are out there on the fields. Stockpiling, I think the grazing season, but it could be an option at least to get started through the winter, winter depending on how many acres you have available. Uh, this is where you can take some maybe excess acreage and beginning in August, stop grazing it and then, uh, you know, see what the fertility is and you could soil test to get a handle on that. Sometimes a um, little boost with nitrogen fertilizer will really increase that stockpiling. And then you don't start grazing it till after growing season is over. So in this shot, you can look where that heifer is behind the fence. It's been grazed down pretty short and trampled. And then in the foregrounds, that hasn't been grazed yet. And the, if the snow isn't too deep, deep, you know, your animals can get down there to, to graze. If, once it starts to get crusty or icy, that makes it much more difficult. This is another shot that's been, um, animals have been out here quite a while. It's been tightly grazed, quite a bit of trampling. You know, it'll set your pasture back in the spring. But on this farm, I'm guessing that was part of the game plan to set those fields back a little bit here. So how about bale grazing? Um, the bales are placed out in the pastures late in the fall as the conditions allow. You know, you separate the bales um, by fences and you can kind of allocate by the number of days that you estimate that can be fed on those bales. I'm thinking with the current fertilizer prices, any wasted hay might be even more valuable out there on the pastures to help improve that fertility. It can cut your winter labor down if you uh, had the bales out there ahead of time. Helps with some paddock rejuvenation. And I did find out um, this week that there is a conservation stewardship program through uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service that will help with some bale grazing practices. So a downside, what will you do if it gets thawed and really muddy? You know, you don't want to really damage a lot of pasture area and move them off to a sacrifice area so you don't really destroy your paddocks. This is a follow-up shot from the uh, following grazing season. That's nice and lush there on the top left corner. A lot of the regrowth looks pretty fertile right there. And then the lower left side, that was uh, in the fall after some bale grazing. I hope you can kind of see the spots out there in the paddock. There was a spot there and there and there. You can really see the boost in that field there from the fertility of the wasted hay and even some manure out there. Um, the rest of the field or this part of the field in here looks a little bit yellowish. Excuse me. Uh, and then on this right hand side, this was from two years after the bale grazing. So it's really gotten pretty lush out there in that field. Feeding pads is kind of a step up from uh, just putting your bales on the ground, kind of helps with mud in the feeding area, but as soon as any animals step off of that, there's going to be some mud created. This is kind of, this is a, a permanent situation. You know, you have to come up with a spot that's going to be maintained. Um, they can be concrete or stone or even asphalt, I've seen. So this requires some planning and site work so you can site those in a good spot, size them to, to fit the needs of your animal herd or flock. Um, this bottom right hand side, that's kind of a higher end spot, you know, higher end pad. Um, 
This was uh, from a farm uh, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and it was within miles of the Chesapeake Bay. So they were pretty concerned about runoff or any water quality issues there. Um, on this site, the animals can feed on both sides. There could be a fence there to divide it up, so it could be two separate groups feeding. The hay was uh, rolled out in the center aisle. Any runoff or uh, when they scraped these pads was put down in the, the far end here. Any leachate or effluent was caught and it was um, filtered out in a kind of a terraced area over here. They did have 150, or excuse me, 140 cows on this operation and they had two of these pads set up, but they had kind of thought um, after they installed them that they might've been better off with some kind of a barn with a, a roof overhang, which in that picture, you can kind of see the roof line there. And that would have been a spot too, where you could set up um, a covered feeding setup there, which for the size of the operation, it would be a little bit more practical than a, a small herd or small flock. So which, I don't know if anybody's heard of that one. Um, I kind of think it's more of the Cadillac of feeding pads. I didn't really look at the prices of any concrete or asphalt, but this is kind of a newer system. And it is, um, it takes some design and site work and it needs some annual maintenance as well. So the pad has uh, several inches of wood chips in this layer. And then the next layer is some drainage stone. And then this is a compacted uh, sub base. And it does have drainage tiles to, to carry away any leachate uh, off into a, a filtered area, grass strip. So these are just uh, some photos from some pads. And the, the upward end of the cost on this would be roughly $920 a cow, which I, this was a, from a few years ago. So it's kind of pricey uh, depending on how many you have, but these animals are pretty comfortable. You know, there's no mud, no mud whatsoever in this. It does require annual maintenance. A couple of inches of the chips kind of need to be scraped off with any manure, uh, and then they need to be replaced. But it's just another option. If you, you have a large enough operation, you know, it may be more beneficial in making, making a bunch of mud somewhere else. So wind, wind breaks are important, so just slow down that wind and help with the, any wind chill factors. If the guidelines state that uh, wind breaks need about an 80% blocking of the wind. So if they're uh, completely blocking that wind, the wind can go up and come, come right down or go right around. And there's a shorter distance there protection behind it. That helps reduce the livestock bunching up right up against it. And it can help keep that air moving too, just on the health side of things. So these are just a couple of examples um, from Nebraska, you know, and hedgerows are a good example of this done in different farms. Edge of woods can work as a, as a uh, windbreak, but I'd really like to see uh, limited access to the woods. You can't really see any fence in this photo. Uh, any forester in this uh, meeting tonight would greatly appreciate to keep the cattle out of the woods. They can do some damage um, to the woodlot and tree destruction or damage. This is just taking advantage of a natural hedgerow. Um, this farm has sheep. They have a, a hay feeder here, and then they roll out some hay in this spot here. Um, this gives it the sheep uh, some bedding as well. So what they don't eat that they can uh, rest on, lounge on, just to stay a little bit more comfortable. And this was uh, a windbreak I saw on a farm and I almost think that 
the farmer that I took the picture on has joined the meeting tonight. So it, it, he can chime in later if he wants and give some feedback. And I thought this was a pretty cool option, um, something to bit, that you could build with some rough cut lumber. You could scale you know, up or down, however you needed for your flock or your herd. What I don't recall was what the support was on the other side. You know, you don't want something that the animals are going to tip over. You know, an option would be to set this on the other side of the fence so the cattle wouldn't have access to and get rough with it. You can use bales of hay or, you know, uh, straw or whatever you have or whatever you can get um, to help. You work is a is a windbreak as well. You can see these photos kind of allow some air to pass through as well. Uh, you want to make sure they stack. You stack them well so they don't roll off the top in a big windstorm. But there is that airflow to get through there. Shelter belt. You know, I, I've never seen one really in this part of the country, but specifically planted. You know, we do have quite a few trees around in New York, but this is something that takes a little bit of a long-term uh, planning and it's a long-term project. You know, um, it's a mix of deciduous and evergreen trees. It just slows down that wind from the, the prevailing winds there. And you can keep your animals kind of downwind there and, and um, or even in there during severe weather. A whole bunch of different kinds of feeders that are out there. And sometimes it comes down to what's your personal preference, what you have equipment to handle it with. The one here on the right, I just kind of want to highlight, you kind of get what you, you pay for. You know, if you buy something cheap and uh, sometimes you're, especially cattle will get kind of rough. But these, some of them do a better job of um, conserving hay. This cone-shaped one here, there's less waste of the hay and they estimate it's about 5% loss with those kind of feeders. Um, if they have a metal bottom in them, the waste can be about 13%. And then without any bottoms, the waste is about 21%. So this one on the left, I seen those, but I thought it was kind of interesting. It had the cover on it. It was kind of that cone shaped. So that might be a, a good option to try. But again, any, any waste can uh, be used for bedding or it'll add to the fertility if you have it out on pasture. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some feeding options. You know, if you have short supply of hay or um, maybe not always high quality, but I'll get into that a little bit later. But um, what, why would you feed uh, late in the day? I wish we were all together and I have somebody answer that. But um, lots of times you'll feed in the morning before you go to work. You know, you do your chores early. But a reason to do that maybe late in the day would be um, since you're feeding ruminants, that ruminant there acts as a fermentation vat, which generates heat, and it would just help your animals get through the night to they stay warmer that way. You know, winter days tend to be short, so it could be dark in the morning or night. So um, it's kind of your option, or maybe what you could do is just use this strategy when it gets to be really cold stretches. Yeah, my phone's ringing, but sorry. Uh, what if you have some different quality hay in the farm? You know, there's options that what you could do with that. Maybe feed that poorer quality early in the winter, you know, and save that higher quality uh, for the colder times. And I'm hoping that everybody does test their hay to get a handle on that quality. Another idea might be to feed both hays at one time if all livestock have access to both hays. So they have kind of a, a mix that they can kind of choose from. If you have enough 
hay out in space so all animals can access it, those more dominant ones um, will allow the timid ones to get a chance to uh, feed if the space is if the space is limited, they'll cause issues. So limit feeding, I don't know if anybody's heard of this approach, but um, you have to really use some careful management. The cows are need to be in adequate body condition and they're only they're limited to feeding about six hours a day. And usually an ionophore is fed along with that, something like rumensin. This is a way to limit hay waste and it increases feed efficiency. So the cattle learn when it's feeding and clean everything up. There was one study that was referenced and intake was re reduced 20 to 25 percent. And with that reduced intake, it slows down digestion and that passage rate. And this is, again, you really need to forge test that hay that you feed to, to know that you're, you have a high enough quality that you're feeding and you won't have a train wreck with um, body condition loss on your animals. Here I took from a farm that he used to get um, sweet corn silage from the processor and he set this system up and he built these panels here where the, the cows can stand on the bottoms of them. There's a metal um, metal part to those those panels and they can have kind of limited access to that silage. It's kind of a, uh, um, a large self feeder. So he could actually go away for a couple of days and somebody would just check on them, but they could kind of take care of themselves. So this might be an option, you know, it's a little larger scale, but um, just something else to think about. So onto some water, really it's the most important nutrient that you can give to your animals. Um, again, water drives that intake. So this is an energy free fountain where the water, it comes out of a frost free hydrant, goes down in the ground in this reservoir storage area and that ground helps keep that water from freezing. And these little balls up on top here, keep the surface from freezing over. So it's a way to maintain uh, water supply. So can went to the University of Manitoba and found this. You have to have snow for them to eat it. It's got to be on the right side of the fence, and they need to be able to reach it. It needs to be clean snow, and it needs to be loose and not all crusty and frozen. I took this from a farm. I, I, I'm not quite sure if it was designed for water use, but I thought it was kind of a cool way for a place for animals to stand next to the water tank. You know, that way it doesn't create all that muddy, mucky mess. You know, it could be used year round and it helps to reduce that compaction around the water tank. So it was kind of light on the water side. I'd like to hear what everybody does, if anybody has anything else to share. But you know, in summary, it's really important to monitor the weather so you know what's going on and what to anticipate, what to expect. Provide some wind protection. You want to maintain the adequate body condition the best you can. So have some bedding available, whether it's spilled feed or bales rolled on the ground or even straw or something else available. Supplement the feed is needed and always provide that clean, fresh water. So if you're looking for help, I think your local extension office can help whether you're in Delaware County or your local office. And uh, there's um, Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Soil and Water Conservation District. They're very helpful and there's also some cost share opportunities for uh, conservation practices if you're looking to improve things on your operation. There's uh, university resources. And also I found some great resources on YouTube when I was looking up some information. 
So with that, kind of open it up for any questions or discussion.